Okay, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to The Current. This is the North Central Region Water Network's speed networking webinar series. We're so glad you could be here with us today. I am Rebecca Power. I will be uh, your moderator and I'm joining you from the University of Wisconsin-Madison Division of Extension. The North Central Region Water Network is an extension-led collaboration among 12 land-grant universities and our partners um, in 12 upper Midwestern states, go figure. Uh, and today's topic, I'm very excited about uh, communicating conservation to land owners and land managers. So, um, you know, we focus on a range of topics from more of the, the environmental uh, environmental sciences to the social sciences. And we're excited to talk about one of those social science components today uh, and what we can learn uh, from researchers and, and also practitioners in the field uh, that have been doing this for a long time and, and their experience. So before we introduce our speakers, a few uh, tips for you uh, part, for our participants, so you can engage with us in the conversation. We want you to be sharing your experiences uh, as well. You can submit your questions for our presenters in the Q&A panel. So we will have a dedicated Q&A session uh, following uh, each of our three speakers or after all three of our speakers are done. That Q&A panel uh, can be found, um, you can click on that Q&A icon at the bottom of the webinar screen to access that panel. If you are experiencing technical issues or if you have other you know, questions related to the North Central Region Water Network or this series, you can use the chat feature. Um, so Q&A for questions for our panelists and the chat feature for everything else. If you are having audio issues, there is a phone option and that option can be accessed by clicking the up arrow on your mute icon or your, your microphone icon uh, and sw um, clicking switch to phone. So uh, this, this session will be uh, recorded and available at northcentralwater.org. And uh, you can also, uh, if you'd like, join our listserv uh, listed at the bottom of this page if you're interested in, in keeping up on things. So without further ado, uh, we have three great presenters today. Um, Dara Wald, who is an associate professor uh, at uh, currently at Texas A&M University. Colin Weigel, who is a behavioral economist at the California Air Resources Board. And uh, you will see how that relates uh, in a minute. And Serge Koenig, um, uh, conservation technician at Sauk County uh, land Resources and Environment, Environmental Department. Uh, you can also follow us at North Central H2O on Twitter uh, and hashtag the current uh, on Twitter for live tweets. Okay, now the show that you have all been waiting for, uh, uh, Darwald is going to kick us off. And uh, I'm not going to read her entire bio there. I'll just let it linger for you to look at for a minute. But you can see um, she she was uh, in the Midwest for a little while. So she has experience in our region, in addition to a number of other places in the country working on water issues. And she's been winning some excellent awards for her work. So we are so pleased to welcome you, Dara. And I will now stop sharing my screen so you can share yours. And just remember to unmute too. Yep. Thanks for the reminder and thank you for the introduction. Get my slide up here. How's that? Looks good. Okay, wonderful. Well, thank you very much for inviting me, Rebecca, for Amory, for all your hard work to make this happen. I really appreciate it, um, the opportunity to, to talk. Um, to get us started, I just want to say this was work that I did with my collaborator, Laura Witzling, um, at Iowa State. Uh, when I was there as well, I just transitioned over to a new position at Texas A&M. Um, and so I have been at the, in the Midwest for the last six years um, and have a lot of great collaborators still at Iowa State and connections there um, as well. And I have a new project that's starting with collaborators in um, Michigan, 
and at Iowa State uh, and as Texas as well. So I'm very familiar with the system. Um, and this is kind of a little bit of a departure for me in terms of my scholarship. Most of my scholarship is um, actually doing the surveys. Uh, so this is the first time I had done a review of surveys, uh, which was very fun. So briefly what we did in this particular study is that we conducted a systematic literature review of quantitative work about farmers, conservation, and communication. So when I talk about some of the things that we find, keep in mind that the scope of this work was pretty narrow. It's not to say that this is all the work that's ever been done out there on looking at farmers' um, perspectives. So keep in mind that the scope of this was fairly small, as you would generally do for a systematic review. You'd find one or two research questions that you're trying to answer. Uh, and so this was one of those things where we were looking at a, a, a small sample of the work that's been done. And our goal in doing this was to try to understand some of the trends in the ways that surveys are being uh, sent out to farmers and the things that we're finding in those survey results. Um, and in general, we really wanted to provide some guidance for future work, right? Here's what we know, but here's where we're going and here's what we still need to know. Um, and to try to provide, provide some guidance for practitioners and for scholars who might be working in this space. So the problem that we were really interested in was nitrate, nutrient pollution, in particular nitrates um, that can contaminate drinking water uh, and impact water quality. Um, as we all probably know, this is a big issue, um, both in the Midwest and throughout the watershed um, that, uh, throughout the different ecosystems that influence um, the, the Midwestern watershed, but also all the way down to the Gulf. Um, and in particular, we were concerned about, you know, the role that nutrients play in contributing to dead zones, um, aquatic life and impacting the economy. So this is the problem that we were looking for. We took this um, results from the state task force. This was part of uh, a study that was done by the EPA in 2017. Um, this were the priority watersheds that we were focused on when we did this work. This is where this problem sort of came from, was understanding um, how the watersheds all the way through the Mississippi um, that flow into the Mississippi River, um, what was happening in terms of nitrate pollution uh, was sort of the motivating uh, driver behind this study. So keeping that in mind as well is important. Um, and in particular, the role that farming plays in impacting the water quality in that system. And, and I think that's important to say that it's, you know, this is obviously not the only factor that impacts water quality in our system, but this was where uh, we ended up focusing because we know the important role that farmers play in the system um, and in uh, being land stewards and so that was one of the reasons why we focused on farmers and surveys about farmers. So we started with sort of what we know, right? We know that um, a lot of public and private entities doing great work to encouraging, uh, encouraging farmers to adopt conservation practices and farmers themselves being really interested in adopting conservation practices to address nutrient pollution. And there've been a lot of studies that have been done uh, to look at the factors related to farmer adoption of these conservation practices. And Procopy et al. is just one uh, fairly new-ish uh, study that came out um, that did a really great job of, 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 of sort of pulling that literature together. And we wanted to build on that. So we asked sort of three questions. One was how have scholars previously measured farmers' information seeking, their selecting, and their sharing? Our second question was, you know, what distinct farmer audience segments have scholars described? Again, looking at these surveys that have been done. And this third question, which I'm gonna focus on just because I don't have a long time today, I'm really gonna focus on this third question just for simplicity, um, but I'd be happy to answer any questions you have about those first two questions that we asked as well. And this third question is what trends emerge regarding how farmers actively and passively seek select and share information about conservation. In other words, we know that there's a lot of information out there, but what we are really interested in is what do we know about how farmers share that information, how they find that information, how they choose and filter out what information is perceived as trustworthy, as credible. Um, and that's partially because that's my area of interest, right? What is the role of trust and credibility in um, behavior and then the adoption and the interpretation of messages? And so we use this stops theory, essentially, which is a situational theory of problem solving. And what stops suggests, just very briefly, 
is that um, we really need to think about audiences not as like one large audience, right? The public is not this big single group. There are lots of different publics, right? And each of those different publics and each of those different groups wants different information, right? They have their own communication behaviors and they're gonna adapt or respond to communication based on their pre-existing beliefs and attitudes. And so we really wanted to dig a little bit deeper and not treat uh, our farmers as one group, right? But really to understand that there's lots of different groups with lots of different interests here. And they might actively seek, select and share information in really different ways. And so that was the framework for the work. We used the web of science, we scraped it from 2009 and 2019, and we used a whole bunch of search terms. These are some of the ones that we used. And we found 103 different studies that fit our criteria. Remember, we're only focused on surveys that were quantitative. Right? And so what we found were a couple of themes. And again, remember, I'm only going to talk about research question three for the sake of time, but the study has been published. I'd be happy to share it with anybody who doesn't have access to it. Um, so one of the themes that we found or when we did all this work was that farmers seek and receive information from, about conservation from a whole bunch of different sources. It's not that all farmers are going to one source, right? They're looking and often looking at at least three sources or channels of information. The other big theme that we found was that accessing information doesn't appear to be a major challenge to farmers. In other words, farmers can get this information. What seems to be the challenge is this, you know, this gap between information and behavior. We also found that in general, farmers prefer information from extension, specific information, uh, particular agencies, and they want information from their personal connections. They want to be able to interact with folks face to face, right? They want to be able to know the person who's giving them that information. I will just add that doesn't necessarily mean that they don't want information um, through social media. And I'll talk about why I think why I'm saying that uh, in just a moment. The other thing that we found that was really, really interesting is that news media probably play an important role, but very few survey studies actually included measures or variables about news information. And then the last thing we found is that there was a very clear connection, or there was a very, there was a, there was a lot of um, conversation about the connection, but we're not 100% sure what the connection between attitudes and information is and partially we don't have that information because we found only one study that really looked at communication related variables and their association with attitudes and that means that we're just not asking those questions we're just not running those statistical tests to see what the association is and that's really a big gap in the existing literature. Again, remember the narrowness that I talked about at the beginning, right? I'm not saying that, that that literature doesn't exist at all, but we didn't find it in our systematic review. And we suggest that that's a really important thing. And I'll talk about what those are, why those are important. So thinking about all those results together, I wanna to leave you with a couple of very brief conclusions and implications that I'm hoping we can talk about more in the discussion. First, um, if you want attention as someone who wants to engage with farmers or agricultural audiences, really we need to think strategically about linking with multiple sources and building a network of partners. Because again, farmers are going to go out and get lots of different information. Um, and so if you're just that one person who's sending out that one message, right, you might not be the only message that they're receiving. And so thinking about ways that you can group with groups and sources of information that farmers might see multiple times, right, because it's not just a one shot. I send my message out and it's accepted and people change their behavior is really a much more complex ecosystem um, that farmers have to search out information. The second thing we recommended in the study is that future survey work should really use a variety of questions about sources, right? It shouldn't just be radio uh, or TV, but to dig even deeper and to ask questions about specific news sources, specific channels of information. Um, because there's just not a lot of specificity in that in the existing surveys. And so we can't answer the question about what is the impact of media on farmer uh, attitudes or behavior without asking those questions to begin with. Uh, and the other thing we suggested is that farmer uh, surveys, the future surveys should avoid vague terminology, right? It's really important if you're going to run a survey to go out and pretest your questions with the audiences that you want to engage, right? So being very specific about your terminology, that's something you can do if you pretest your questions through focus groups, through 
interviews. Um, and so I, we recommended that in the paper as well. Um, the third thing is this point that I've made a couple of times, but I want to reinforce it, that media sources um, really could be included much more in survey questions, right? Who are the media outlets? What are the ones? What do you trust about them? What do you not trust about them? Um, and questions specifically about media sources. I think we need to get a little bit broader um, in, our, in our questions that we ask about that, because otherwise we just don't know how farmers are using different sources of information. Uh, and the last thing is to consider asking about attention to media. It's not just about uh, whether they access the media, but whether they pay attention, right? I might have access to lots and lots of news sources, but I only pay attention to one, right? And that's a really important question that wasn't, wasn't there. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to highlight, which I think is a really important question when we're thinking about trust and credibility, which again is my area of interest, um, that when we sometimes we ask farmers questions about um, agencies, but we really need to go again, just as farmers aren't one group, agencies aren't one group, right? And we need to think, allow space, I think, to ask questions as opposed to asking about general sources, such as government sources or state government, to really specify what are the agencies that you're interested in, who are the folks in those agencies that, that farmers work with and would trust. Um, again, to get at this nuanced more nuanced perspective of not just one public, not just one audience, not just one source, but really to parse out more specifically some of the nuances there that are really important. Um, so that's a brief overview very quickly of the study that we did uh, and some of my work, but I'm very happy to answer questions. There's my contact information and my collaborator, Dr. Laura Wetzling's uh, information as well. Great, thank you so much, Dara. And you can see why we call this our speed networking webinar series, right? It's to give you a tease of the great work that uh, these folks are doing. And then, um, so you know who they are and you can follow up with them for more information if you would like. Um, so thank you, Dara, great, uh, great start. Okay, I will now um, share my screen again. Okay, you seeing the right thing there? All right. So our next presenter, I have the pleasure of uh, introducing Colin Weigel. And Colin is a behavioral economist at the California Air Resources Board. So he also works on behavior change and economics to improve environmental program and policy design. Uh, he too has worked at a, a number of different places before landing at his current location. And uh, I, with that, again, let you scan the rest of his, um, his bio there, and we'll go ahead and, and let Colin tell you, um, tell you about his research. So Colin, take it away. Great. Thank you for the introduction. Um, let's see here. Are you able to see my presentation now? Yes. Okay, awesome. Uh, okay, so thank you so much for being here and, and inviting me. I'm really excited to talk about this work. I'll be talking about a couple of different projects, all sort of focused on how do we message people and how do we test that? How do we learn if what we're doing has an impact or not? Uh, so real quick, I am at the California Air Resources Board. Uh, the opinions stated here are not those of the agency. And the work that I'll be talking about was done while I was at Johns Hopkins University and the Nature Conservancy. Uh, so a big thank you to my, my co-authors who are listed here. Although really good stuff they did, any mistakes are probably my fault. All right, so uh, let's see, think about what works. So there are a lot of ways to implement a program. We often don't know which is best. How should we re reach out to people? What kind of message through what medium? Uh, what kind of framing should we use? There's hundreds of ways that we might imagine doing something and we usually don't know which is best. So how do we decide this in practice versus how should we decide this if we were to think about a, a good design? Um, so usually it might be the loudest person in the room, um, might be the highest ranking person in the room, it might be the person with the most experience. We know that the, the loudest person is probably a, a pretty bad rule to use when deciding what kind of, uh, what kind of implementation we should use, um, but it's still something that's selected. The, an issue with all of these is that we don't know uh, what actually was best, and so when we go to, to implement the program the next time, we still don't have good evidence to, to base our, uh, our our new implementation on. So what can we do instead? 
we can test things. So first test uh, was something we sent to over 30,000 landowners in the US Corn Belt, Iowa, Indiana, and Illinois. Um, and we tested three different types of message framing. Uh, one emphasized the economic uh, benefits of conservation. Another one was the economic and environmental benefits combined. Uh, and the third one was to say nothing about the benefits, but just to use what we call like a, a simple uh, uh, probe it at information. And what we did here was invited landowners to return a postcard to learn more information. And for that, they'd actually enter a downstream test of a real conservation program. So this is one test of messaging where we test three different kinds of framing. All right, another test that we did was sent to about 3,000 farmers in Iowa, uh, especially in erosion prone regions. And what we did there was test a targeted information, so information that has state versus local level information. And what we did here was ask farmers to complete a brief survey to try to measure their engagement. And so what do we do? Uh, we want to test, learn, and adapt. So thinking about how do we test something, uh, both of these tests have the, the same structure, which is that we have a target population. We randomize uh, who gets which version. Um, so we don't want to select the, the farmers with the, uh, you know, the ones who have already done conservation get, get one message and the ones who haven't get a different message. Uh, instead, we want to randomize so that we know that the, uh, the change in outcomes is due to uh, the difference in what they received. And we try to measure a real outcome. So it might be measuring uh, returning a survey. It might be measuring participation uh, in a program. Um, but that's trying to measure something real so that we know the impact of the message that we sent out. So the first one I'll talk about was a, uh, about enrolling non-operating landowners in an environmental program. Uh, what we did here is that we had to recruit people. So the first step to a conservation program is to letting people know that it exists. So we figured we might as well test what works. So we tried to recruit people who later on we'd test uh, information, nudges, and, and a financial incentive to see what was most effective. Um, and here we were like, all right, so we're going to recruit them. Uh, what will we do? There's no consensus in the literature. So if you if you dig through the literature, if you dig through what companies are doing, you can find something to contradict everything else. So there's no real consensus about what you should do. Um, and the, sorry, this was joint work between the Nature Conservancy, Purdue University, and Johns Hopkins. So who are we messaging? We wanted to recruit these farmers, or these landowners for a conservation project. Uh, we targeted non-operating landowners. They have a, a pretty low rate of conservation practices on their land. Um, so they're a really important group and they own a whole lot of land, especially in the Midwest. Uh, again, this was sent to over 30,000 uh, non-operating landowners, which is about a third of all the, the non-operating landowners that we could contact in these three states. So we randomly drew a sample, uh, which was large and representative uh, and, and highly relevant. So we have three different messages. You might ask which one is most effective. Uh, so this is the front of a postcard. Um, the postcard came in the mail. They could then respond to it, saying that they'd like to learn more information. And what varied between each of the messages was what was on the front of the postcard. One said, what is soil health? One said, increase your farm asset value. Another one was, ensure a sustainable future while increasing your farm asset value. So what is soil health doesn't really have a frame to it. It's sort of a simple informational appeal. Increase your farm asset value is an economic uh, motivation. Uh, and the, the third one is a dual economic and environmental message. So what did we find? Um, if you look at the literature, you could find support for any of these. You could also find a reason to not use any of these. So it wasn't very useful. So we had to test it in the field. Uh, what we found is that among the knolls without cover crop experience, the simple what is soil health message was significantly better than the economic message. The economic message had about 22% fewer responses. Uh, highlighting the economic benefits might not be a good message for people not already to uh, choosing to use conservation practices. And here, uh, you know, it could be a success, could be that we, we didn't really find something that stood out as being amazing, um, but we did get a, a cautionary tale about that economic message. Um, and so even though we didn't find something that was amazing, that's okay. We need to test, learn, and adapt, test, learn, and adapt. Uh, and so repeat this over and over. Um, there may be other strategies that would be more effective for uh, engaging folks. So what about targeted messaging? So this is for a different sample of, of folks. This is for uh, farmers in Iowa, in particular in high erosion areas. So along the, uh, the Eastern coast or Eastern uh, side of Iowa. 
so the information here is uh, localized versus uh, state level. Um, and the local information could be more useful. So it could be that local information about soil erosion um, gives them more to act on and is more engaging in that sense. Or it could be that it just helps the, the message stand out when it comes in the mail. Farmers receive an enormous amount of uh, advertising in the mail. So to stand out is a challenge. So we test here, we randomized whether farmers got uh, local soil conditions. So the, the Huck 12 watershed, which is about 40 square miles. Um, versus something at the state level. And we try to measure engagement rates, which is response to a survey. This is joint work between the Nature Conservancy, Iowa State University, and Johns Hopkins. It's also funded by uh, NWF. So here's the, the two messages that we sent out. So again, this was randomized. So people either got the message on the left or the message on the right. Uh, let me highlight the differences here which is that we have some information in the packet, which is at the state level. So talking about the amount of nitrogen and phosphorus that's lost due to erosion uh, at the state level, along with a picture of Iowa and, and again, state level information versus the Huck 12. So to communicate the Huck 12 watershed, um, we thought a lot of people might not know what it is. So we sent um, a, an image of the county. So the county we think is recognizable, especially to farmers. And here we've highlighted the uh, the Huck 12 watershed. Um, so they may recognize that their uh, their land actually lies within that relatively small area. So there was a cost to doing this. And so part of the test is to find out if um, if the, the cost is made up for by the increase in response rates, or even if there's an increase in response rates. We could imagine that farmers don't really like it when you tell them you have a lot of information about them. Um, if we have information about them, they might actually uh, reduce their response rate and, and choose not to engage with us. So what we found is that local information did increase response rates, and it was by about 20% which is roughly the amount of the additional cost of customizing uh, in this particular trial. Um, so it's, it's neat that we didn't find uh, that, that the extra information was off-putting. Um, instead, there was an increase in the response rate. Um, and something that, that really came up here is that both in, in this trial and the previous one, we actually used a pretty large sample of the farmers and landowners that we could message. So it doesn't just come down to cost savings. So we know that increasing response rates is good because of cost savings, but it could be that your program can only be scaled so much. Um, for our, uh, our message to landowners, we messaged a third of the landowners across three states. So we just can't scale that up very much. So it makes uh, increase in response rates that much more important. All right, so what should you remember from this? Uh, targeting messages with local information may be a good strategy. It, it might be uh, worth the cost. Um, highlighting the economic benefits of conservation might not be a great strategy, especially to those who aren't uh, on board with, with conservation practices to begin with. Uh, and in particular, overall, it's important to test what works. So we have to be willing to accept failure. Not everything works. If everything works, uh, something's wrong. You're either measuring something wrong or just too lucky. So you should be finding that some things don't work, um, but that's okay because if you fail in, in one attempt, but then you find another one that's a success, you can keep using the success, stop using the failure. Um, what we've seen is that even with financial incentives, uh, they don't always work. So we have the uh, the Noel Cover Crop Adoption Program. We sent out a survey asking people if they would accept a financial incentive to do cover crops. Uh, we then also offered uh, a subset of them the actual financial incentive. And the survey, 45% of people said that they would take it. In the actual real world trial, only 1.5% did. Um, so it's important to, to go out there and test it, see what works in reality. And if it works, great, keep using it, keep adapting and, and developing on it. If it doesn't work, that's okay. Um, but be willing to accept that and move on and, and change what you're doing. So uh, thanks so much. I'm looking forward to the discussion. And if you have questions, I'm, I'm happy to address them. Great, thank you, Colin, appreciate that. And excellent, okay, I will now Go back to sharing my screen here. Hopefully that'll clear itself up. All right. All right. Uh, and now it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Serge Koenig. So we've heard from a couple of folks that are doing research um, with farmers and non-operating landowners and you know folks that are working on conservation at larger scales. and. 
And I am pleased that we get to hear now from Serge Koenig, who uh, is uh, in the Sauk Sau County Conservation Department. Uh, he has been working in Sauk County for 27 years and counting. Uh, he has a watershed management degree from and a soils minor from the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point. Go Pointers! Uh, and he's just uh, got a lot of uh, great insights uh, from those years in doing conservation on the ground. So uh, with that, I will stop sharing my screen and can. Getting this funny. Uh, okay, there we go. Okay. Let's see here. Okay, I think we're ready. Looks good. Okay, excellent. Thank you, Rebecca, for the introduction. Like Rebecca said, I've been working as a conservation technician here in Sauk County uh, ever since I graduated. And it's been such a good fit that I've stayed here and I guess they haven't let me go yet and that's a good sign. Um, and so, yeah, I'm definitely gonna be coming at this from boots on the ground perspective. This is not a wide sample size and my way of doing things here might not fit well for others, but this is what's worked for me over the years. And I've tweaked it over the years. Um, but before I get into all that, it, maybe it helps to frame, give you a little bit of background of who I am and where I came from and how I've come to this work. Um, so originally I'm from Madagascar for the first 11 years of my life uh, spent there learned a new language, moved to the US in 82, and by now at this point. Um, and what, so my father was a crop duster. And so the joke is that, you know, maybe he pollutes the environment and I clean it up. It's a little, like a job security thing we have going. But honestly though, he'll, he also applies cover crops on fields. He, he just, he had to decide if, I want, if he wants to pursue his commercial license, in which case he would not see his family much or become a crop duster where he could, we could see him on a daily basis. And so this is what he chose to do. He just recently retired four or five years ago. So getting to yes, um, there's, a lot of knowledge, there's a lot of knowledge out there but all that knowledge, if it doesn't get transferred to landowners in a way that moves them to action, it really doesn't do any good. And so I've just been tweaking things over the years to try and get, to find a way that works, find a way that really moves people. And so, so often it's like, it's the way we ask questions even like, oh, what do you do here? Like, can you explain to me, you know, how you do this or why you do that. And what I find is people really love to talk about themselves um, and farmers are no different. And you know they, they love to be the teacher. And so you're the student and I literally take notes and, and I'm really interested. And in that, that goes a long ways, you know, because I'm really making an effort to understand them and listen to them. And I've also volunteered on farms early on in my career. I milked cows for a dairy farmer for a three week stretch. And then just a couple of years ago, I volunteered on a beef farm where we made fence and laid water lines and moved animals and ran the finances and kind of was helping run the business in essence. And so that's the kind of stuff that gets around to farmers. And so it looks like you really are making an effort to connect and understand them. At their, at their level. And so what I find is there's an awful lot of patience and calmness that it, that it takes in order to, to get there. Um, there are many folks that I, I come to their farm and within that day, within that hour, talk them into saying yes to conservation of some kind. And for others, 
I say one to three here, but I, I have one of my biggest success stories. It took five years actually to talk him into adopting rotational grazing as an example. And it is really easy to, to just give up on it. You know, so I tend to persist a little bit, but yet there's a fine line there where you can't be a pest either. And so what is it? Where's the balance? I don't know. You just have to practice. You just have to do it. And, and you figure it out. And each person is different. And depending on what happened in that day, did they lose an animal? Did, did something break on the farm that's going to cost a few thousand dollars? Something happened to with relationships on the farm. You just don't know what you're stepping into. So it, it is different in each situation. And the, and the act of saying, I don't know. I mean, obviously, we don't know all the answers and need, neither do they. But don't sit on it. Just move on that right away. I don't know, but I'll get back to you right away and make sure that you do. Um, I like to keep it simple oftentimes. And it's easy to, there's a lot of abbreviations um, that could, that we tend to throw out. So NRCS, you know, EQIP, um, DADCAP, LRE, there's just a lot of that. I try to keep it real simple. Like this is a county program and this is a state program and here's the federal program. Here are the federal folks. Here are the county folks. Here are the state folks. Just keep it real basic and simple that way because it's kind of like if you went to a doctor's office and they spoke to you in high level, you know, language about the workings of your body and DNA and RNA and replication and osmosis and all of that, it would, it would turn you off if you're not interested in that. And so I find that too much of that jargon turns people off. It's like, oh, government speak. They're tuning out already. At that point, you've lost them. So staying calm is awfully important. Um, it's important that you just don't bolt right away because that's our temptation is, well, obviously, if it's unsafe and you, and you can read that probably, most people can, well, get out and protect yourself. But an awful lot of times, someone's just yelling and Literally, I've seen it so many times. They yell, and it's like they exhale, and then, now, what are you here for again? And then I know they're listening at that point, and then I tend to rephrase their frustration. What I heard you saying, sounds like you're having a hard time with this or that, or this person from our office you had a difficulty with, and you know, I'm sorry about that. I'm just kind of rephrasing it like, yep, I, I listened to you, and I heard you, and I also saw you embarrass yourself in essence, because that's kind of what it feels like. If you've ever lost your cool, it's like, oh, I just made a fool of myself. I don't feel good about that. And this person stood here and watched me make a fool of myself. And, and they're still here. And so a classic example I just like to give is, yep, made the appointment the day before, talked to his wife. She says, come on out. We're usually done with chores around 10 o'clock after milking cows. I'm like, okay, I'll be there. I show up. Apparently, she didn't tell him that I was going to be there. And so if body language is everything, I mean, it's like she jumped off the tractor and was kind of in my face and every swear word in the book was thrown out. And I just stood there calmly. And it's just weird. All of a sudden, he was done. Well, what are you here for? And before I left, I had talked him into putting up some roof gutters and some barnyard work and some other things. And it, that happened within probably an hour or so. And it didn't start out well. So like it was important for me not to bolt off. And I guess that's, that takes a lot of practice and nerve to do that, I would say, and patience. So the question is like, well, is, is this an art or is it science? I think it's both. It really is. And you can say practice makes perfect, but you're just trying to get better all the time, really. You're never going to be perfect at this. You're going to read people wrong at different times, but it, you just get better at it. And you have to want to do it. Because if you don't want to do it, you're not going to go through the extra work of like being patient and taking the yelling sometimes and, and all that comes along with it. It's, it's messy out here in the field. It's not clean cut. And um, it takes an awful lot of patience too. 
And so it, it would be like, so, but you have to want to do this. And this is what the job requires, I feel like. And so if you're not willing to do that, well, it just might be a wrong line of work for you. That's all. There's nothing wrong with that. Just know your fit. And that may not be the best fit for you. So this is what happens, I think. I was just thinking about this the other day and I jotted these down. And it's kind of like we all have our favorite seats in the house, you know, watching TV or whatever it is, you know, but it, it, it gets awfully comfortable there. And that's the way farmers and all of us get, we get comfortable and we see things from that same angle all the time. And we kind of settle in, we almost to the point where we indent the chair a little bit. And what we're trying to do as resource professionals to try and move the conversation along and not just that, but to act on those conversations is we're trying to get them off of that couch and move to a different chair. You're still looking at the same landscape, but you're just looking at it from a different perspective. And it's, it changes it. I, I found that it really changes people. It can. I still will get the middle finger once in a while, and that just comes with it. But, but it oftentimes, it's like it's, it's a slight shift. That's all it is. All we're trying to do is get a slight shift, a different perspective, and then off that goes. And then I nurture that along. I'm, a lot of times I feel like I'm a cheerleader on the sideline. Like, yep, that's good. You got it. You're on the right path. And, and off we go. Um, and as I get to know people, it's like I, I try to get right down to the heart of things. Because this is the stuff that really makes everlasting change, I would say, in someone's psyche. is like helping them figure out what their why is. Why are they doing this? You know, and it takes a little bit to get there. I mean, you have to build the trust and lots of small talk and all kinds of other things. And it takes a little bit of time, but eventually I do like to get to this. Why are you doing this? Do you feel trapped? Um, is this because this is what we do? Do you even love this anymore? Should you change gears? And I've helped people out of farming too. I just, just talked one out of farming last year. You know, it's like you could just tell his passion wasn't in it anymore. He was doing it all for the wrong whys. And so it was time for him to walk away, kind of walked him through that then. Um, it, many of you probably have read this already, but I just found this book to be pretty powerful. And so Viktor Frankl is in a concentration camp and he's also a trained physician, psychologist. So he's paying attention the whole time and he made it through the ordeal and wrote this book. And in this book, he. You know, he talks about like, you could, you could tell when somebody lost their meaning or their why, in essence, because it wasn't long after they passed. It was always within a few days they were gone. And, and you know, like he had his why. I think he wanted to write this book to talk about his experience. And he also wanted to see his wife again and some other work that he, that's what, that was his reason. That was his meaning and that was his why. And so, I do, re I reference this with my landowners a little bit as a way of like breaking through, but it also helps me understand landowners a little better. And then we go down this road. Hey, if you don't know where you're going, any road will take you there. The next glitz and glamor. Oh, that looks good. Oh, nice tractor. Oh, nice. Look at this fertilizer. You're always getting sucked into things because you have no direction and you, have, you haven't figured out what your why is. And of course, if you don't know where you're going, well, any, how do you know when you've gotten there? Are you just going to chase and chase and chase? So these are really difficult, in-depth, heartfelt conversations that I try to have with them. Because then when we're at that level, then I suggest like this or that, and they move. Because there's, there's such a trust there um, that's built up. And it takes a long time to get good at it. But it just takes the desire to do it in my opinion. So we, and then we get to like creating goals and objectives so that we're farming with a plan. It's just not willy nilly. It's like, well, I do this. This is what I do. But, but why? Okay. Well, then how are you going to get there? How much do you need to make? Everybody wants to be millionaire, but do you need to be? And how much do you need to be happy? So we go through that whole thing. Um, I've had to learn about financial management and psychology, sociology, and all those things really help on the ground. 
So we talk about smart goals. You guys have seen all this. And I go through the sheets with them even. It just solidifies what we're talking about. Example of a smart goal. Want a grass-based dairy farm, milking 70 cows by spring of 2021 with a debt tax. I mean, that's the kind of stuff we'll, but it's not always to this level. Sometimes it's just relationship stuff or farm soil health stuff. That's what we will set goals for that. What kind of goals are important? Your lifestyle. Why are you even living on the farm? Do you even like it here? Should you move into town? And why not? Why are you still here then? I mean, it's some really poignant questions asked in a nice way, obviously, in a gentle way, so that it's not threatening, but I'd already established the trust so they know where I'm coming from. I'm not here to, I'm not here to get anything from them. I mean, I'm gonna get paid whether they do this or not. I actually do say that too, like, hey, whether I help you or not, why don't you put your tax dollars to work and use me as a resource? So that's, I think, the end of it. Great. Thank I'll you, share. Serge. Thank you. And I'm going to hold off on uh, sharing my screen again so we can all maybe see each other for this Q&A. And we'll, um, as Anne said in the chat, we will share everyone's contact information. Um, at the end, so you can get that if you'd like. All right, so um, first question I'm gonna uh, raise here is from Adina Risman, and Adina, uh, and, uh, Adina says, some, of, some people might say there's no unframed message. So um, what is, you know, the soil health message has a strong, potential environmental, as well as a health framing, which we don't always think about. Um, and some people uh, refer to this, and she prefers to this as what is soil health as a pro-environmental frame with a curious, non-judgmental tone. And I think, Serge, you said how you say something is also important. So curious to hear um, the panel's thoughts on that observation from Adina. Yeah, so I'll, I'll kick it off. Um, yeah, I totally agree. There's a lot of ways to think about the differences between these messages. Uh, so we we use three different messages. Um, that, you know, you could come up with hundreds of differences between there, at least dozens of differences between them. So how judgmental is it? How long is it? Um, you know, is there like a, a tie in between the agency sending it? So this uh, came with a label of TNC on it. Um, might that affect how things are viewed? Lots of moderators. Um, there's Lot, lots of hypotheses, but we don't know which of those are actually true. So it would be great is if people say, you know what, I think that what matters here is that this is a non-judgmental tone. So we're going to use, um, you know, here's here's something standard set out by another agency. Um, we're going to use something similar, but we're going to change the tone. Um, there's a, a test done in, I think, Denver or so, uh, looking at, at changing the tone of the message sent to uh, people uh, around the time of COVID to get them to participate in a program to, to alleviate their like housing payment. Um, and by, by trying to use a non-judgmental tone, they got an, an uptick in, uh, in a por portion of the population. So I, I agree, you know, is it a, a uh, environmental frame? Is it a non-judgmental frame? Is it, we could, could call it a lot of different things, um, but what we need is a variety of testing um, to really hammer in on those specific points and figure out you know, what works, what doesn't, and maybe come up with the guidance for practitioners of, hey, here's, you know, here are some good messages to use. Here's what makes you, you know, not come off as, as judgmental and, and is usually a good opener, especially for folks who don't already use conservation practices. Okay, any other thoughts to add before we move on? Okay, all right. Well, we had a slew of uh, questions on uh, why 1.5% implemented practices when a much larger percent said they would, why, and then Tim is hypothesizing about why that might be. Do you think the lack of adoption of cover crops by non-operating landowners was due to the lack of communication with tenants who are doing the farming or something else? Sure, yeah, so um, yeah, good question. It's, it, it'd be really great to know why that is. Um, you know, we could chalk it up to, to hypothetical bias that when you ask people, I mean, you know, if you ask me, am I gonna go to the gym tomorrow? I'll tell you yes right now, whether I actually go or not is, is uh, less than 100%. Um, so 
Yeah, and, and this was, so what we tested here was we took a, a big group of people about, um, about 2,200, we divided them into groups. Some of them got the actual financial offer. Others were given this survey question. So we don't know who, uh, we don't have people who said yes on the survey and then didn't do it in reality, because that'd be sort of a, a weird structure, um, but rather just we know that amongst this population, 45% of survey respondents would say yes um, on the survey, but in reality, only 1.5% actually take it. We could, you know, when you think more carefully about it, so when there's, uh, in this case, $1,500 on the line, um, you know, you're having to think about it more and say, okay, there are a lot of challenges to organizing it. Oh, doing this, doing it this year is challenging. Maybe I, I actually mean I do it next year or somewhere down the line. Um, so there's a lot of things that could come up to stop someone from actually taking a conservation act, uh, action that they're generally in favor of. Um, but it's really hard to pin down what, what it is. What we did do was hypothesize about some of those things uh, and did a follow-up really small experiment where it was uh, high stakes. Um, so we followed up with 100 people um, who'd not been offered the financial incentive and we offered them $5,000 to do 40 acres of cover crops, which is a really high payment rate, about $125 uh, per acre. Uh, and we thought, okay, if this doesn't do it, then there's, there's something else missing. Um, and here I think we got about a 5% take up rate. And so for half the people, I called them on the phone personally to, to remind them that this existed and, and ask them about it. We gave them extra time and um, we included a, a, our behavioral nudge was a template. So a contract template between the landowner and the, the operator. So they only needed to fill in a couple of, a couple of blanks. Um, and so it should have made that process easy. And so again, here, the idea was that we tried something uh, at, at pretty good scale tested to see if it worked based on interviews and uh, that we had done with folks who, who are knowledgeable on the topic. We designed something that we thought was pretty good, including the, the financial incentive was a contract that was like a page long. It was incredibly short compared to anything USDA might put out. Um, and yet we didn't have a very large take up rate. Tons of possible reasons for that. But again, what we need is additional testing. We need people to go there, come up with, you know, I think that it was because it was coming from the Nature Conservancy. That's why people didn't want it. Uh, it's because you didn't remind them enough. It's because they didn't have a 20 year contract or the ability to renew. Uh, it's really expensive to do. We would have loved to do it, but we didn't have that much money. Um, lots and lots of ideas. We'd love to see them tested to see what works. Surveys are a great way to generate hypotheses, but we need to test things on the ground with real financial incentives. Nicole, that's great. I would just add also that this is pretty common in survey research that you have this social desirability bias where people feel like, oh, this is from an organization that I like and I need to um, over report what I would I need to go along with it. Right. And I need to say yes to, you know, because they've taken all this effort to send me a survey or they think, oh, well, who, you know, someone's going to look at this and think that I'm not a bad farmer. Right. I'm not a steward of the land. So there's lots of reasons that people over report on surveys. And so there could be survey components in addition to the things that Colin talked about, about the barriers to behavior that could have contributed to that. Um, and so we see this a lot in surveys that people say, you know, we always think we're better than we are. Um, and uh, we tend to want to please, we want to please people when they send, take the effort of sending us a survey. Um, and so it, especially there can be gender differences there too. Um, and so I do think that that's something we see pretty common, uh, pretty, pretty regularly. And so to Colin's point about testing, I think that's fundamentally important. Um, and I think it's really important to test it with the audience that you want, as opposed to a lot of surveys are done with undergraduate students at the university, right? And so that's not the, that's not necessarily the final person who's going to make the decision on the farm. And so um, making sure that your tests represent the population that you want to represent, that you really want to see if they'll change behavior, right? We have to do that as well. Mm -hmm. Well, and I'll just jump in here and say, you know, it also makes me wonder about some of the things, Serge, that you were saying about the importance of relationships and the importance of being able to come back and have conversations um, time after time, which is a little bit different than the here. Uh, you know, we're, you know, Colin, I think you were seeing where, how far money could get you, right? Um, and which was not all that far. So I, um, in this case, so I'm, I'm, Serge, I'm just wondering if you have anything to add. I, I agree. It's like you say, it's the relationship stuff. I think once that's established, I think you've heard me say this a bunch, Rebecca, but it's like it's people come first, second, third, and fourth, and the conservation piece is actually last because it's the people that control the land. So if you've lost the people, you've lost your ability to influence the people that control the land. And so 
if you put your focus and most of your eggs in that basket, and I use different methods, it's finances. Obviously, I know we can look at the long game in conservation. I see one of the questions here talking about that. Yes, I get that that's important, and I know that, and I think I was focused on that for the first 22 years of my career. Just long game of conservation, it's important to conserve. That's fine, but you gotta put food on the table. You gotta, you have to pay the mortgage. You have, you have this, if kids are wanting to go off to school, you gotta help them through that. And there, we have to actually deal with the here and now. And so I think as soon as I started running more of the fine enterprise budgeting, financial type planning with producers, then you're taking more of that whole person. And they're, they're not, they understand then that you're not just in it for you, that you're in it for them too, because that's awfully personal. My, the money that, that's in or not in my bank account, that's personal. And so when you get to where they're sharing that, well, now literally you suggest things and off we go, you know? And so relationships, like you were just saying, Rebecca. Thank you. And, and I'm going to um, get to David's question here now, which is also kind of a long game question, but in a bit different way. So, you know, David is saying, well, it, you know, are you asserting that eventually everybody is going to participate? Uh, and he's saying that, you know, that's not been his experience. Um, so just, you know, anything you want to say about folks that, you know, you may never, you know, may not be interested in changing, you know, in adopting conservation practices at all, even with those uh, multiple visits? So you're, yes, you're never going to get everybody. And it's impossible to think that you are. And if you go in with that mindset, but there are a lot of folks that are on the fence, or on your side. Um, but they just don't know how to express it, you know, for various different reasons. And so you can waste your time on that one person, or you can already convince two or three other people why you're waiting. I mean, so I, I choose not to waste too much time on people that the only way we get past this, I mean, this sounds bad and sounds morbid, is when the person gives up and stops or, or passes on. Um, that's the only way it changes. It doesn't change otherwise. And so why are you wasting your time? Well, there's hundreds of others who are ready, who are right on that fence. So work on that and, and message, use that for your messaging. Like, and, and you get a read for like what's important for them too. Like oh, if, they, if like the kids and wife or husband, if those are the things that really matter to them, I really kind of, that's where I go. Or if finances... Well, that's where I go. I, I just read them where they are. And, and hardly ever do I talk about conservation. It doesn't hardly, it kind of comes along for the ride. I always feel like we'll talk about this stuff and then I'll interject like, oh, by the way, that soil of yours, it's, it's pretty good. And look at the water, it's inf infiltrating. I don't see ruts out in your fields anymore. That waterway is looking awfully clean. And so that comes along as a, by the way, but the primary focus of the conversation is um, establishing that is, is about what matters to them and then figuring out what matters to them. And when someone lets you figure out what matters to them, well, you're in. I mean, that's, that's the ultimate in trust right there. So that's kind of my approach. Thank yeah, Rebecca, you. if I could add to that too. I was just gonna say, I've been doing a lot of thinking about what credibility is. And I think what Serge is saying to me, right? When we define as scholars, when we define credibility, we often talk about trustworthiness, expertise and goodwill. And what Serge is talking about this last part of like how your work, how your programs benefit somebody else, that idea of being a, a person who's looking out for someone else is I think really, really important um, and scientists, um, techno scientists, right? People who think about technology and scientists, we're not prepared often to have those conversations. We're prepared to talk about our expertise, our grants, our publications, right? Our data, um, but we're not prepared to have this conversation about how does my science, how do my findings benefit you? And I, I think that's a real 
problem with the training that we have for scientists and techno scientists. And so in the next couple of years, like that's where I, my research is going. And so I think what Serge is saying is spot on, right? That we need to have these conversations with an understanding that yes, we might be experts, but we have to meet people where they are and, and, and make sure that we are talking about and understanding what they want, but also how the work could benefit them and where what they need, right? And I think that's so such an important part of, of this conversation about um, the audience. And to me, that gets you know the heart to the heart of all the three talk, talks that we gave today is right, understanding what your audience wants and needs, um, and how to reach them through empathic communication and communication that um, come you know is credible, not just because you're an expert, but because you want to understand what somebody else wants and needs. That's really important. Excellent. Well, on, on that note, um, I, you know, I think that was a great summary in thinking about uh, these relationship based conversations that we're having and how important they are and also how some testing, you know, can also be some message testing can also be valuable. Um, so it's really this this combination of methods in in a spirit of goodwill. Um, I love that uh, language, Dara. Thank you so much uh, that we're um, hopefully we can carry with us uh, from today into the rest of our work. So um, thank you to our presenters so much for an excellent conversation. Uh, you, I think you're seeing there, you should be seeing their contact information here so you can follow up with them uh, if you would like. And again, I thought, I thought it was better to, to see them a little bit more clearly than to have this slide up. So uh, hopefully this gives you enough time to copy down the information that you need. Um, just a final uh, closing point here. We have two upcoming webinars we wanted to share with you. Uh, Yahara wins past, present, and future uh, with our uh, sister project, Grassland 2.0, and also uh, and the long-term effects of cover crops on soil health. And uh, that uh, uh, webinar will be Wednesday, March 16th at 2 p.m. Central with our Soil Health Nexus team. Thank you so much uh, and have a great uh, rest of your day.